Good morning. Hi, I'm Liz Kruger. I'm the state senator from the 28th district in Manhattan. And if you live in my district, and if you don't, welcome to you all. So this is the a morning session for us. We've often been doing evening and late afternoon given the COVID reality that we all end up trapped in our homes anyway. Um, but this is a morning, um, part of a morning process we've been doing now for multiple years. We usually do this at Lennox Hill Neighborhood House um, and we appreciate their co-sponsorship, but we've moved almost everything in government and in life into Zoom right now. So we want to welcome those of you who haven't been with us before and you may be viewing on Zoom or Facebook, or you can be calling in um, to this event and listening on the phone. Before I get to today's proceedings, I want you to be aware that we have closed captioning options. As a viewer, you have to activate closed captioning to view the, the text on your Facebook device. And if you're on Zoom, I think it's automatically on and you go to the CC section and you turn it off if you're finding the transcription um, disconcerting to you. But for people with um, visual issues and hearing issues, this can be actually very helpful to them. So again, if you're on Facebook, you can turn on the closed caption CC to start the viewing of the captions. And if you're on Zoom, you can probably have them on automatically and turn them off the same way in that system. Before we begin, I would like to talk to you briefly about the vaccine rollout process. We're dealing with multiple challenges related to getting New Yorkers vaccinated. One challenge is the vaccine supply, which is extremely limited right now. The state is exploring different possibilities for how to increase our supply. And I think we are all more optimistic. Things are going to improve with the inauguration of President Biden yesterday. There, are, there is a hotline and website challenges as well involved with finding and scheduling appointments because since there isn't a lot of vaccine, there isn't a lot of appointments. I have sent a letter to the governor with my concerns and recommendations for how to make improvements. So this is not such a frustrating and stressful process. The letter outlines the need to improve access for some older adults who either do not have technology available and or the skills needed to navigate the online appointment process. At this time, healthcare workers, designated essential workers, adults older than 65, are eligible to receive the vaccine. If you have already had your first vaccine dose, please make sure to get your section, second vaccination at the same vaccine site. If you would like to look at the letter, we have sent the governor, it is up on my web pages. And of course, our detailed daily, often daily updates about what we know and what is going on in the world relating to COVID um, is available almost every day through my email system or online at my website. So this morning's event is a very important discussion and it's a discussion that does not need to be depressing, but rather enlightening about our options. I'm very pleased to host this round table and be, the series theme this year for 2021 is being mortal, thinking about the end of life decisions we make today. We'll focus on palliative, oh, excuse me. Let's try this again. Being mortal, thinking about end of life decision making. Today, we're gonna to focus on palliative care and hospice services. We have an extraordinary group of professionals to talk to us about this. And I know that I have used hospice care for both of my parents at their end of life. And it was incredibly valuable, not just to them, but to the entire family um, in moving through that process with them. First, we're gonna hear from Dr. Sean Morrison, 
the chair of the Ellen and Howard C. Katz Brookdale Department of Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine at Mount Sinai. I bet that doesn't fit on a card. Then Dr. Morrison will provide an overview of palliative care and hospice services, explain what they are and what these services offer. Following Dr. Morrison, we're gonna hear from Adrienne Rudin, who received her doctorate and is a palliative care nurse practitioner at Brookdale, also too long to fit on a card. She will discuss palliative and hospice care in a hospital setting because hospice options involve in your home and in hospital settings. And our final speaker will be Brenda Green, a social worker for palliative care at home. She will describe this innovative model which provides access to high quality medical care in a setting most comfortable to patients and caregivers. After the presentations, I will moderate a Q&A of the town hall. And if you are on Facebook, you can write questions into Facebook and my staff will um, basically review them and get them to me. Many questions were submitted in advance. So I do have a healthy number of questions to ask already, but if there is something that you just don't think we've gotten to and you wanna hear about, please make sure to type your question um, into the Facebook options or actually the Zoom chat as well. You can also type into the Zoom chat. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Morrison. And when he's done, he will introduce the next speaker. Good morning, Dr. Morrison. Good morning, Senator. And thank you very much for having me and my colleagues um, on today and for giving us the opportunity really to talk about a relatively new healthcare specialty, which is palliative care, and also to talk a little bit about um, what hospice is and the important differences between the two of them. And so let me, um, let me begin, and Katie, if I could have visuals and slides. And go to the next one, um, just so um, I'm very clear, I have absolutely no financial in, um, conflict of interest. Um, I don't own stock in any um, health related companies. What I wanna do for my sort of brief um, 15 to 20 minutes is really accomplish three things with all of you. First, I wanna put this into perspective and talk a little bit about why palliative care is so important in today's society and indeed be going to become more important in the years ahead. I wanna talk a little bit about what palliative care is and a little bit about what you can expect from it and why I think it is one of the key solutions to some of the challenges our society is facing in terms of healthcare. I'm then gonna turn it over to my colleague, Adrian Rudin, who is one of the nurse practitioners in our department, um, who's gonna talk a little bit about what palliative care looks like in the hospital. And then she's gonna to transition to Brenda Green, who is also one of our um, social work, or is one of our social workers within the department. She's gonna talk a little bit about what palliative care is at home. But I wanna begin by putting this into a little bit of perspective. And what I have plotted on this graph here is human life expectancy from when people first walked across the Bering Strait into North America about 20,000 odd years ago, plus or minus a year, up until 2021. And what I wanna point out to all of you is that human life expectancy stayed almost exactly the same. That is somebody born in what is now New York City could expect to live somewhere between 35 and 40 years for almost 20,000 years. And it is only very recently, a blink in the eye of the eye in terms of evolutionary terms, that we have seen this dramatic jump in life expectancy, where right now the average American can expect to live 78 years, a little longer if you're a woman, a little less if you're a man. Um, and like many things in this country, there's a disparity and whites live longer in this country than non-whites. Katie, can I have the next slide, please? 
And I want to also point out that not only are we living longer, but there are a lot more of us as well. This is what we in geriatrics call the squaring of the age pyramid. And what this slide shows is how the population has changed as time has gone on. So for example, in 1900, if we look, um, Katie, can I have the screen? Is that possible? Um, brilliant, thank you. Um, because I want to be able to use my mouse. Thanks, folks. So if we look at 1900, what we can see is there are very, very few people. This is percent of the population along the bottom. This is the age group that goes up here. You can see there are very, very few people over the age of 65 as compared to the rest of the population. 1970, this is the baby boomers, by the way. Um, 1970, you can see there's a little bit more. But what I wanna point out is really the change that we're gonna see in 2030. Because what happens in 2030 is for the first time in all of human history, all of human history, the number of people over the age of 65 is going to be greater than the number of people under the age of 18. Now, remember back a slide ago, I said that the average age of an adult in the United, the average age that people can live, expect to live to in this country is 78. Well, that's kind of a meaningless statistic because that is everybody. If, however, you manage to live to age 65, which I expect most people on this call are either at the age of 65 or expect to live beyond 65, average life expectancy is not 78 it jumps up to 84. And for those, the 50% who get to age 84, you can expect to live to age 88. And for the quarter of the people that get to age 88, you can expect to live until your mid nineties. So what is it like to be an older adult in the United States right now, and what is it going to look like in the years ahead? Can I have the next slide, please, Katie? Oh, no, I've got it, thank you. It's a challenge. And it's a challenge because we have seen major changes in the cause of death. And so back at 1900, when average life expectancy was 45 or 50, the leading causes of death in the United States were all infectious. Pneumonia, influenza, tuberculosis, dysentery, and 40% happened in children. Let us jump forward to 2019, and I am being very careful here about 2019 because 2020 is going to be very different. But in 2019, if you look at the leading causes of death, they are all chronic disease. They are diseases with which people will live for many, many years, sometimes decades. They are all progressive and, and they coexist with each other. The good news is that we have changed cause of death from 40% in children down to less than 0.15%. Now, why 2019 on this slide? Because COVID has made 2020 very different. And as things stand now, COVID has now become the third leading cause of death in the United States. Um, and there is the potential that it will move and come close to cancer and heart disease moving forward. I am, like many of you, very optimistic that 2021 and 2022 are going to be very different. Katie, can I have the next slide, please? Sorry, I've got them. Um, so what that means, however, is that living with a chronic disease can be incredibly, incredibly challenging and difficult. Um, and there's this myth out there that 
all of this sort of builds up and happens right at the end of life, you know, six months or so before death. The reality is though, that the burden of chronic illness happens over years, not right at the end of life. This is a slide that I put together that looks at the symptom burden, what people can experience on a daily basis who are living with the leading causes of death in this country, heart failure, stroke, cancer in pink, dementia in green, lung disease in purple. And this is the symptom burden for much longer than the end of life. This is the sim daily symptom burden for six months or more. And what you can see is that, for example, 25% to 70% of people will report pain on a daily basis. 20% to 45% will have feelings of depression, fatigue, low energy, problems with appetite, anxiety, breathlessness, that the benefit that we've experienced of living much longer comes to a certain extent with the cost because as we live with chronic illness and chronic disease, we live with the challenges of those diseases. We also live with the challenges of disability. And what this slide demonstrates is the number of people, zero up to 70%, who have challenges with simply a normal household activity, like preparing a meal, cleaning, shopping, and here we can see that in our 75 plus population, 40% of people experience that challenge. The red line is a challenge with walking or mobility. And what we can see is that in our 80 and over population, over a third, nearly 40% have difficulty or challenges in walking. And if we look at the yellow bars, this is the percent of people, again, let's stick at 75 to 80, 15% need somebody else to help them with the basic activities of caring for themselves, getting out of bed, feeding themselves, going to the bathroom, walking around the house. And there are other challenges to living with chronic illness as an older adult in this country. In 2015, almost 3 million households with a person over the age of 65 experienced food insecurity. And three out of five older adults, that is over the age of 60, who are eligible for supplemental nutrition assistance aren't enrolled and simply are not accessing the services which they are eligible for. And as too many of you know, living with a serious illness can cause tremendous financial distress, even if everyone had Medicare. One third of senior households have no money left over each month or in debt after meeting essential expenses. And again, two thirds almost two thirds of households headed by an adult over the age of 60 have some form of debt. And the median amount of that debt is almost Serious illness extends beyond patients to families as well. And in 2020, we know that there are 44 million Americans who are delivering unpaid care at home to a seriously ill relative. Half of them are working age, 18 to 49. On average, they're spending half a working week, that is 24 hours in caregiving, and one in four are providing over 40 hours per week in caregiving. And again, this is not 
just at the end of life. 70% are providing care for more than one year and one in four are providing care for more than five years. And we have a lot of literature and data that demonstrates that stressed caregivers are at significantly increased risk of almost every single bad outcome we can think of. Death, depression, reduced quality of life, heart disease, loss of work, loss of savings. You're muted, Dr. Morrison. Thank you. Um, and we are spending a tremendous amount of money. No, oh, need to go back. Sorry, folks. To get these results, um, this is a graph that shows healthcare spending as a percentage of gross domestic product for a number of countries that look sort of like the United States. And what you can see is that everybody's healthcare costs are gradually going up. And we should expect this. We have an aging population. We're getting much better at treating chronic illness. We have new technologies, new medications, and we should be spending healthcare on people who need it. But need I point out the outlier? This black line is the United States where we are currently spending a little over 17% of our gross domestic product on healthcare. And our nearest neighbor is Switzerland, which is spending about 12%. Now, this would be one thing if we were getting results for that spending, but we're not. What this graph shows, and it's a little complicated, but on the bottom line, as you go over, this is the amount of money we spend per person on healthcare. This, is average life expectancy. And as you can see, for most countries, there's a nice pattern, which is the more you spend on healthcare, the longer you live, except again for one country. We spend the most money on healthcare than any other nation, and we get life expectancy, which is about what we see in the Czech Republic, Turkey, Estonia, and Chile. I'm gonna skip this just in terms of time. And when we will start to see who are we spending the majority of healthcare money on, it's people with serious illness. It's people with multiple chronic conditions. It's people with dementia, it's people with frailty, it's people with functional limitations. And most of these people are not in the last year of life. This group, represents about five to 10% of Medicare enrollees, and yet it accounts for 50 to 60% of all spending. So what does that mean? We're spending a tremendous amount of money on very sick people. That's a good thing. We should be spending money on people who need it. And yet what we're seeing is the same population living every single day with serious, severe physical and psychological symptoms. We're seeing tremendous burdens on their families and their caregivers. We're not seeing increases in longevity that go along with that spending. And in fact, I would suggest we're not getting good value for the money that we're spending. The good news though, and this is where we turn to the good news section of today, is we have a solution. And that solution is a new team-based healthcare specialty called palliative care. What is palliative care? Well, palliative care grew up in the late 1990s as specialized medical care for people with serious illness focused on enhancing quality of life. And the story behind palliative care comes from Senator Kruger's introduction, which is this country developed in the early 1970s an exquisite system of care for people who are dying. That is called hospice. 
And hospice was embedded in the Medicare program in 1982. What does hospice do? It treats distressing symptoms. It provides support for families and caregivers. And its, its focus is on ensuring that people have the best quality of life that they can. What's the downside to hospice? The downside is you have to be dying in order to access it. You have to have a life expectancy of six months or less if the disease follows its usual course and you have to be able to say, I only want to focus on comfort and I will give up all other medical treatment. That's not a good match for most of us because most of us are gonna live with serious illness for a lot longer than six months. Most of us can benefit from life prolonging treatments, technology, and most of us wanna stay with our doctors. So why should hospice be limited? Or why should that type of care to be limited only to people who are dying? And that's what a lot of us started thinking about in the early 1990s. What happens if we took all the best that was hospice and said, you don't have to be dying to get it. You should be able to get it in the setting of any serious illness. And that's what palliative care is. And so what palliative care became is a team-based approach because if you're living with complex serious illness, you need a team. And you need a team of doctors to address the medical aspects. You need a team of nurses to address quality of life and specific nursing expertise. You need social workers to be able to address the complex psychological, emotional components that go with serious illness and to help you coordinate care in a very fragmented health system. And you need chaplains to address your spiritual distress. And you need them all working together with patients, with families, with the other doctors, to provide the extra layer of support that patients and families need in the setting of serious illness. And most importantly, palliative care is appropriate at any age, from infants up to centenarians, at any stage of a serious illness, and can and should be provided together with curative or disease-directed treatments. This is what we used to think was the healthcare system. You started, you had a disease, everything was focused on that specific disease, not on the person. And at some point, sometime, you recognized you were dying and you got access to hospice. What we say now is that you don't need to be dying to have a good quality of life. The palliative care within this nice gray triangle intersects with traditional medical care. All of us are focusing on pain and symptom management, psychological and spiritual care, goals of care discussions, ensuring that the care you receive is the care that you want and coordinating care, that for people who need it, they can also get rehabilitation to bring them back to their quality of life. And for that group right at the end of life, hospice remains available. And I can think of no better example of the role that modern palliative care plays than when we faced the COVID surge and pandemic in the spring in New York City. This is, these are pictures from my healthcare system, Mount Sinai, in April, actually April 8th in the middle of COVID. And what was palliative care's role? Well, in the emergency department, what did palliative care do? Palliative care went and saw patients who were confused because of COVID, delirious, had breathlessness, anxiety, and we focused on treating those symptoms. We were the team that brought the iPads in to talk to patients' families and to allow patients to speak to their families. We were the team that spoke to patients and said, what do you want from your hospitalization? 
What are the treatments you want? What are the treatments you don't want? And while we did that, it freed up our emergency physician colleagues, these folks right here, to go and see other patients, to manage the crises that were happening because they knew that we were a team with them that were embedded in the emergency department. And we together allowed us to see so many more people save so many more lives and assure comfort for all of the people in our emergency departments than if the emergency physicians were there alone. It was a dramatic response to the pandemic. It happened in our emergency departments. It happened in our hospital units. It even happened in the tents that were outside the hospital. It was our team that went in to make the connections between patients and families. And for many, many New Yorkers, it was our team to make made sure that nobody ever died alone. They may have died in isolation. They never died alone. And that was a key, key distinction. And I think one of the things that we did do was bring that comfort to everybody. That's how we operate day in and day out. We provide the added layer of support for people we expect to get better, for people who expect to live for a long time with a chronic illness, and indeed for those who may not survive the illness, but are going to continue to receive treatments in the hope that they do up until they do. So as I turn it over to my colleague, Adrian, I will not bore you with all of the research data that our group and others throughout the country have done, but I will tell you the summary that when palliative care is provided at the same time and integrated with other usual care and what I typically call traditional medical care, four things happen. One is quality of life improves. People feel better and they know they're getting the care that they want and deserve. Families are better. We have higher family satisfaction and higher well being. For certain groups that we've studied, people live longer. Cancer patients live longer when they get palliative care and usual care because, quite honestly, if your pain is treated, your anxiety is treated, your family is well cared for, you don't have to come into the emergency department, you avoid unnecessary hospitalizations where you can get a superbug from us, you'll live longer. And I have never had a single one of my patients say to me, you know what, if it's not necessary, I'd like to visit your emergency department and I'd like to spend a week in your hospital. I've never had a patient say to me, I'd rather be there than at home. And by providing the added layer of support in the community, what it does is it allows people to live safely where they would like to be, which is at home. So that's sort of a 30,000 foot view of what palliative care is. Um, and what you really want to hear is what does this mean to me and what does it look like and how do I get it? And for that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues. Um, first, Adrian Rudin, um, who's one of our nurse practitioners, to tell you a little bit about palliative care in the hospital. And then to Brenda Green, who's one of our social workers, to tell you a little bit about palliative care at home. Adrian, I think the floor is now yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Morrison. And yes, we'll be sharing my slide now. So good morning to everyone on the call. And I'll give a little brief background of you know my history with palliative care and coming into New York's health system as a registered nurse over 10 years ago in trauma, right? And so I saw a lot of the things that Dr. Morrison was talking about of kind of, you know, a miscommunication, a discoordination of care. And I kind of in my naive way said, oh, but this is because this is something that's traumatic that's happened. We couldn't have planned for this. And it must be better in those who have chronic serious illness. And then as I began to expand um, and take care of those now with serious illness, I realized there is a lot of work to be done. And that's how I became interested and um, a fierce advocate for palliative care. So, I have spent over 10 years now in a hospital setting in New York in a couple of different areas. 
and really focusing on disseminating palliative care. So when you come into the hospital, what would palliative care look like for you? It would most likely be a consultation service. So Dr. Morrison had mentioned how it's that extra layer of support. And so you would come in and the doctors who are directing your care will hopefully recognize that you can benefit from the services that are provided by a palliative care consultation service team. But it is always, um, you know, recommended that you also be an advocate of your own care, right? And so you are more than welcome to uh, request a consult for yourself. And what comes along with that consultation? So it's an interdisciplinary team. As we've mentioned before, it's so important to have a whole team surrounding you. And so in addition to whoever is directing your care while you're in the hospital, whether it be you know, your oncologist, your cancer doctor, or um, your diabetes specialist, um, we will come in with our own team members, which includes a doctor, nurse practitioner, nurse, social worker, and then probably uniquely to us, is a whole host, and it will depend on you know what facility you're in and, and how large of a facility you're in, of um, other team members such as a chaplain, right? And it doesn't have to be denominational. It can be just in general spiritual um, art therapy, right? Some, some people really just cope in different ways um, and and maybe communicating to family or friends through words is not the way you communicate and you would wanna work with an art therapist to kind of communicate feelings in a different way. Child life therapy, something that's so important, preparing you know, the family unit and preparing whoever is gonna be at home for what's going on and the changes that they're seeing, um, how to appropriately talk to children of all different ages. Um, something unique too is massage and not the kind of massage you think of, you know, from a spa, but more of a, a relaxation and coping the technique and, and breathing mechanisms, because we know that there is a tremendous amount of physical burden that comes along with serious illness, but we also see an emotional and spiritual um, you know, a, a type of existential distress or suffering that's there too. And in order to take care of a whole person and entire and whole patient, we need to address all of those things all together. And so we work in in collaboration. Um, so it's specialty level assistance with symptom management, as Dr. Morrison mentioned, it's really specific to what you're going through and and the disease, but it's really important to have those other non-physical components be a part of your care plan. It's also really important to have non-pharmacological. So what do I mean by that? Not just medicine, right? We're not just gonna fix everything necessarily with a pill. We'll maybe add a pill and we'll also add text, you know, techniques along with that. Um, and advanced care planning. So advanced care planning, I believe if I looked at the schedule for this overall five series, um, there will be a session later on, but advanced care planning can accomplish many different things. Really in the hospital, what we're looking for is, you know, who is your advocate? Who is the person that can speak for you if you're unable to speak for yourself? And, you know, who's, who's gonna help us outline um, what's next and a discharge plan and what your care is gonna look like both in and outside of the hospital. So really to focus on improving quality of life both for the patient, family, caregiver. I say family, but I say that loosely because you know you can choose your family, right? So I don't want you to think that it's, it's just members who you're like biologically related to, not at all. It definitely includes anyone who's stepping up for you to be your support. Um, our support and our therapies and, and, and things that we um, provide definitely encompass all of that. And I actually want to add in there uh, your provider, which is so interesting. Now that we're kind of shifting healthcare, you know, we've recognized um, how much we spend and how little we get from what we spend, we really need to focus more on a quality model. Um, we really found that and providing care like this, it makes the doctors and the nurses feel um, less burnt out and, and 
less burdened by, you know, the fragmented kind of healthcare system that we all are experiencing together. And then improving the quality of care. So we're gonna help uh, coordinate well-communicated care driven by the patient's preferences and priorities. So really care only what works when, you know, the patient's and the family's priorities are, are taken into account with the plan. And it is very well documented that if there's misguided communication, there's a really high risk for readmission, you know, and I think it's so challenging because we need to, you know, there's multiple different um, doctors that may be seeing you throughout a hospitalization. And even when you leave, you'll leave with a whole host of appointments that you'll be following up with and you know, really need to work on that communication of all being on the same page and creating a plan together. Some facilities have a palliative care unit, um, not all. And so that is something you may wanna look into depending on what facility you know, is closest to you or you have your, you know, your care is established. Um, and so that is when a palliative care team becomes your primary team and the primary team responsible for your care. And it's really to address any acute symptoms. And so some examples could be if um, you were having an acute pain crisis and you could not manage your symptoms at home. You would come in, we would examine why that was going on and we would rapidly change medications and therapies in order to get you back home as soon as possible. Um, you know, I think a lot of things can happen. Sometimes there's a little bit of miseducation or miscommunication about the role of pain medication, right? And one of the number one side effects of a pain medication is constipation. And so sometimes it will get so bad that you really have to actually come into the hospital for that. And so you come in, we fix it, we fix the medications, um, provide education, send you home with a better plan to not have it happen again. And then in addition, um, a palliative care unit is often used to prepare and process for the end of life. And so Dr. Morrison had mentioned hospice. And so this is, you know, a time to come to a place where we are seeing that, you know, it's really time where the interventions that we have are no longer working or appropriate and we really need to think about a transition. And not to worry because those establishments who do not have a dedicated unit, you know, the palliative care team in that facility is going to come and bring that to you wherever you are. Um, I think what's unique about a palliative care unit is the entire staff is trained in palliative care. So the bedside nurses, the aides at the bedside that are helping with care um, are really more educated and involved, but Part of actually what I do in my healthcare system is help, you know, overall primary palliative care disseminate throughout the entire hospital. Okay, and so that's kind of a little summation of what you can expect while you're here in the hospital. And I'm gonna turn it now to my colleague, Brenda, who I love when I can send my patients home and connect them to their community resources. Thank you. Good morning and thank you, Senator Kruger and Sean and Adrian for presenting and giving me that opportunity to kind of speak about what it is that I love deeply. I'm Brenda Green. I'm the social worker at Mount Sinai's Palliative Care at Home program. A little bit about myself. I've been working as a social worker in the field of aging and geriatrics and palliative care for over 12 years and I hold an advanced certification in hospice and palliative care. During this time, I focused a little bit, I focused actually a whole lot on hospice at home. And then I came to Mount Sinai when there was this wonderful opportunity to provide earlier palliative inter interventions. During the last decade, there's been enormous changes in healthcare and I'm pleased to be a part of this innovative program bringing palliative care to patients and families so much earlier in the disease prognosis. Working to help individuals speak openly about their choices, choosing their advanced directives and helping them face important challenges to their health is something I really believe in. And I'm really honored to be doing this work. 
Today, I'll be speaking broadly about palliative care in the community and much more specifically about my program. And of course, I welcome all questions at the end of our pr presentation. The next slide, please. A 2011 World Health Organization publication posited the following. The concept of palliative care is relevant only to the last few weeks of life when no other treatment is beneficial is outdated. People needing care and their families experience many problems throughout the course of an illness and need help, especially when problems change or become complex. A much more appropriate concept is therefore that palliative care is offered from the time of diagnosis alongside potentially curative treatment to disease progression and end of life. Palliative care is a component of healthcare that can be needed at any time in life, starting at a low base and rising to eventually become the predominant theme for many. So let's take a look at the next slide. And in the earlier slides from Dr. Morrison, he kind of used that uh, trajectory of disease and there was a little bow tie illustration about palliative care. And it showed the palliative supports can begin at the first diagnosis of a chronic disease. And that's what we're, our ultimate goal will be. But right now, most commonly, when people hear palliative or comfort care at home, they think about hospice and end of life care, but it really can be so much more. The need for individual patients and caregivers to adapt and cope with changes in health and abilities, their situations and symptoms, that happens all along the course of an illness. Our urban setting perhaps increases the need to address these changes early. Um, many people come to the city because they don't want to be in their little town where everyone knows them. And so we have a sense of independence. And that independence sometimes leads to isolation later on. So we look at these changes, we want to look at them earlier, not just in the hospital, not just at the end of life. So let's take a look at what earlier pre-hospice and pre-hospital interventions might look like. The next slide, please. Community palliative care really differs from hospital palliative care as it can provide or build on a longer relationship. In the United States, it's much more common to seek palliative care during a hospitalization or later in chronic illness. And Adrian spoke about what it looks like when we're in the hospital and when we access palliative care. But right now I'm gonna talk about the two types of community programs. These types of community programs versus a hospital program often have the benefit of time to enable understanding of people's needs and goals. This differs greatly from hospital care as we can continually revisit those difficult topics, what we talk about as advanced directives. Individuals often have difficulty talking through this topic and our long involvement allows us to normalize the discussions and talk through thoughts and options outside of a medical crisis. It's much easier to make decisions when you're not worried about what the next moment might bring. So under this umbrella of community care, there's two types of programs that you might encounter. One would be the ambulatory or a clinic program. This is a setting most like what most individuals understand is the doctor's office visit. In this type of program, an individual would either be referred or reach out independently to the specialty practice of palliative care for an appointment. And then they would go to the office to visit for any kind of appointment that they have set up. Two would be a home-based or visiting program, which is where my expertise and practice lies and what I will be focusing on. This is where we travel to you in your home. And I'll speak a little bit about why I think that's so important in a bit. The next slide, please. I'm gonna talk specifically about my program, the Mount Sinai Palliative Care at Home Program, as this comprehensive and beneficial program has served as a model for other programs across the country. And I really feel like this is the standard we'd, I'd like other people to mod, model if they aren't already. But anyway, I digress. This is my love of the program. Mount Sinai Palliative Care at Home is an innovative program, as I said, and we developed it here at the Mount Sinai Health System. And we provide home-based palliative care for patients with serious illnesses. And we have interdisciplinary care brought to the home. 
interdisciplinary care or team care, as we mentioned before, for those who don't know, means that our entire team of the doctor, the nurse practitioner, the nurse, the social worker, and in our specific case, the community health worker, work together as partners managing patients and caregiver needs. We meet weekly to discuss and brainstorm care needs of each patient, bringing together our specific trainings and understanding of the individual and helping to guide and coordinate care. We don't supersede any existing care, rather we supplement. And our team structure is a bit different in that we have a community health worker as the main interface with our patients. They're the team members who call or visit our patients at least once a week and serve as the program's eyes and ears. So what does this type of program entail? What can you expect when you have a, a palliative care team visiting you at home? The nurse and I both go in and meet with patients for an initial visit. And then unless there's a vital need identified, we kind of step back and have the community health worker follow with that weekly visit. Vital needs would include things like may the social worker providing counseling through my unique social work paradigm, having benefit discussions, referring to community resources, helping pe people to understand that they qualify for benefits that they're not accessing, an ongoing review of advanced directives. Our nurse would provide an urgent visit, visit post-hospitalization for follow-up and coordination, look into the medical portion of a patient's care between the doctor's visits. And our nurse practitioner specializes in pain management and does visits for that and monitors pain medication and changes thereof and makes sure that things are really working for people. One of the things that makes us different from other models, as I said, is the community health worker. I really just wanna stress that they act as our liaison for caregivers and our team. They provide weekly contact, they check in on patients' sense of wellness, and if they have any symptoms, they check on the caregivers too. As we mentioned earlier, having caregivers who are worried about their family or providing physical care really provide really is stressful. And we have to check on those people too. Over time, this consistent contact allows for trusting professional relationship to develop. And out of our trust, we're able to enter into the early discussions of advanced care choices and address small symptom changes that might indicate a larger change in condition. Our patients come to trust us as a sounding board and a place to discuss things. And and then bring them forward to their primary physicians and then their own family. Over the past three years, my team has become increasingly comfortable in addressing advanced directives early. So best practices now has all of our team bringing up the topic of advanced directives, which of course is another session, but those are things like healthcare proxy and choices that you can make in advance about your healthcare. And we bring those up during our initial visits and continue to I'm sorry, revisit that at any time during that they are remaining with our program. And I'm gonna take a sip of water at the moment. Okay, next slide, please. So as Dr. Morrison said earlier, palliative care provides an extra layer of care. So what does that look like? We work alongside primary providers and other medical specialists. We don't replace them. We might reinforce the education and medication directions that was given to a patient by an oncologist. We might clarify timing of medications every 12 hours. What does that mean? Do I have to wake up in the middle of the night if I take it at eight o'clock in the morning? Do I take it at eight o'clock at night? What if I take it at 10? Do I, I don't I go to sleep at eight? Or maybe explain how a referral to home physical therapy might work. When a doctor prescribes a new medication, our team has the ability to speak with the patient and see how they feel on that new medication. We're, we are able to address pain and symptoms in real time through weekly contact. And we help patients to document those changes so they can bring those changes and those symptoms to their primary providers, to their oncologists, to their pulmonologist. You know, how many times have I gone to the doctor and when they ask me what's going on, I don't always have a list with me. I'm able to help and my team is able to help people to remember to bring that list. Address caregiver needs. Caregivers, you know, that's the family. That might be the aide, the home health aide. That might be a friend, it might be a neighbor. 
talking to them and understanding where do they stand on the patient's quality of life? Do they understand the disease and what might affect them and their friends? We provide coordination. We coordinate with outside agencies, community resources, and as both Sean and Adrian had mentioned, food insecurity, those benefits. You know, a lot of people don't realize they qualify for SNAP or food stamps, helping them to do those applications, reaching out to the right community resources, um, Meals on Wheels. You know, most senior centers are doing Meals on Wheels even during this COVID crisis, but people don't always know that. Um, are there insurance issues? And most importantly, we advocate for those who've been disenfranchised. So we are a palliative team trained and comfortable discussing aspects of treatment and terminal aspects of illnesses. You know, sometimes our adult children or our friends are not always willing. We give our patients and our, our clients or, or our individuals ample opportunity to discuss treatment options and the impact of treatment on their quality of life. We really are able to serve as a sounding board when you fear that you're being a burden to your family and your friends. I mean, how many times can I tell my, my daughter that you know I'm having difficulty walking? She doesn't wanna hear it anymore. She thinks I should just practice more. I should just walk more, I'd feel better, but I can't because of pain. We're able to address those issues. And then there's a 24 access 24 hour access number for our palliative care at home program. So outside of normal hours, patients and families can contact a palliative physician for advice. And that's important. And this is a model that is carried out across the country because what happens in the middle of the night when you're not feeling so well? This helps to prevent people going to the emergency room when they don't need to. And one of the things I wanna bring up again is we all understand advanced directives, much like Adrian had spoken of. We know what the healthcare proxy is. We understand if you don't have a healthcare proxy that you're going to have to talk about Family Healthcare Decisions Act and who would be next to, based on the state laws to make decisions for you when you can't and helping people to understand the benefit of maybe a living will versus a most. Do I need a power of attorney? Do I need a trust for the the finances I've saved my whole life. I don't wanna lose that little bit of money that I've saved. What does that look like? We're able to do that with our unique skills. Next slide, please. And now we come to the really specific portion of the presentation for me anyway, which is home visiting. This is truly my love. So I forgive me if I drone on about this. Home visiting is really important because the patient is my host. It really shifts the power dynamic. It allows a patient to hold the power in their own domain and we the clinicians are the guests. At a doctor's office, you're invited into the clinical domain and the provider is there for the host. Ultimately, for me, a home visit gives me the opportunity to understand and interpret home life, the impact of home on medical and psychosocial needs. And ultimately, it's a more comfortable place for us to teach or to encourage self-advocacy, to look at understanding of medical discussions, um, medical literacy. And we can help people to be, feel empowered to discuss those things. And I can't underestimate, I, I cannot emphasize enough that it is a gift for us as clinicians to have that visual understanding of patients. In a home visit, I can see pets. I see family. I see images of faith. Do, I, do they have plants? Is there music? We gain an understanding of the physical space. How might this impact this person if or when frailty or mobility becomes an issue? Perhaps we're meeting a patient with dementia for the first time and there's an upright piano and a violin on the wall. That might prompt me to ask about the importance of music earlier in that person's life and ensure that I will touch upon the importance of playing recordings to both comfort and stimulate that person. And we address symptoms. So we can address pain and other symptoms. I might notice a person becomes out of breath when walking to the door with me. And I might be told that this happens all the time. 
I can pass the symptom on, which doesn't occur when you're sitting in the doctor's office, onto the specialist, as well as my team to discuss ways to ease the issue. During the pandemic, we've also become really adept to telehealth. And we do know how to use this form of communication when a person, when visiting in person isn't as safe or as practical as it was in the past. Next slide, please. So ultimately, what is the, the goal of, of palliative care? It's really to increase quality of life. What is important to you? The most important detail of what we focus on in the specialty practice of palliative care helping a person to think through what is most important. Is it watching your family grow? Is it using all available interventions? Is it minimizing pain or discomfort? Or conversely and equally, being allowed to feel pain because it helps me know I'm still here. Understanding an individual is the key component in palliative care. We speak of comfort often, but each person has a different perspective on what we view as comforting. I want to see my grandchildren grow. My friend wants to remain independent at home at all costs. The neighbor across the hall wants to continue ballroom dancing. For each of us, it's a different way of being and understanding this helps us to find the right comfort. It helps patients to ask for care and medical treatments that are right for them. Opening this window of knowledge and understanding is really what palliative care is all about. And this is what I want you to ask for palliative care when you go to your doctor's office or when you go into the hospital so that you have that extra layer. And it's the end of my presentation and I welcome your questions as we all do. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, um, all of our guests from Mount Sinai. And I guess given having, having heard your presentation, it is not a surprise that multiple questions are coming across um, to me of can people use the services of Mount Sinai palliative care if they're not actually patients at the hospital with any of their doctors? I mean, it's, can they figure out how to reach out to you um, and get these services? Or do they need a referral in from their own doctor who might not be part of Mount Sinai? Well, I'll address that quickly. So currently we have a very limited enrollment, you know, it, and it's going to be difficult for us to accept a large volume of patients. But I think the best way to reach out to us would probably, I would say, Sean, you could indicate who would be the right person to reach out to. I'm, I'm more of a, on the clinical end, so I don't have that, that whole access point. But yeah, I, I, I want this program to be available to everyone. But right now we have very limited enrollment. But I have to be honest. Yeah, the answer is yes. Um, anybody can access. We have um, office-based practices both um, downtown in Union Square, um, uptown at Mount Sinai Hospital, and as Brenda said, um, um, community-based programs. Both the program that she is part of, um, and also some others. So if they call, um, go to our website, um, which we'll post up or call um, our um, coordinators uh, if, we can, um, if we can help, we can. Um, not to um, uh, you know, share the competition in New York also has similar palliative care services. Northwell Health has a very large program um, equivalent to ours um, out on the island and um, uh, uh, New York um, Presbyterian also has a smaller program. So they're not that, they're not that hidden. Um, we wish they were more public, but um, it doesn't have to be just Mount Sinai if you're um, um, being cared for by, as my boss says, our competition. Great, appreciate that. And yes, I was gonna mention that there are, you know, multiple map palliative care off uh, centers, and there are also multiple hospice programs, both in home and in hospital. Um, well, I just wanna say personally, since I had, the privilege of working with hospice care for my own parents at their home. Um, and they were at different stages of illness, but died, I guess, within four months of each other. Every single example Brenda brought up was what made the difference for my parents and my family. Um, so I would think that many people listening 
were just shaking their head the whole time, yes. Um, and we advertise this series for seniors and boomers and with an emphasis on younger older people need to understand the programs and services that might become extremely relevant for their own parents as they're taking care of them. And I think that is also crucial, particularly in times of COVID where I think feeling like you're trapped and can't even get to see your own parents um, gives you a sense of more panic and worry and the reaffirmation um, that there are community health services, that telehealth actually can be a valuable model for these kinds of services. Um, and the fact that, you know, these programs exist and not enough people know about them, um, I think is really crucial for us and for my office to help to get the word out that these programs are here and can be so important. Um, one of the questions that has come in is about insurance coverage. Um, are these, I know that hospice services are covered um, by Medicare, um, but are palliative care services, because it's so important to understand, it may have nothing to do with your passing away very soon, um, or it may be part of a cycle, of an extended cycle of older age and illness. Um, do other insurance, and Medicare cover palliative care services if you're not defined as hospice eligible? The answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, palliative care services are covered just like any other healthcare services in this country. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, what I think is an added benefit to having a palliative care team, and Brenda spoke um, to this as well, is that there are many community-based services that can provide assistance to people with serious illness that people just don't know about because that's not what you do on your day-to-day -day basis. And one of the things that our teams are particularly knowledgeable about is how do we get services that somebody may not be aware of, Brenda spoke about um, food, for example, to people who need them when it's typically not covered under the medical care system, but is there is there are other services that people can benefit from. Um, we don't pretend that we can solve all of the challenges that people face in terms of in sometimes inadequate healthcare coverage, um, but we can make the system work a little bit better for people than it does it right now. I've been reminded to ask all three of you to keep your mute off so you can jump in easily. So Brenda and Adrian turn off your mute um, so that we can make sure to hear you when we need to. Um, I was also reminded that earlier I incorrectly said, if you were on Zoom, you could type your questions into chat. Um, a lot of people have already figured this out, but you can type your questions into the Q&A section. The chat actually is not on for taking questions. Um, but we do have, Mount Sinai assorted websites being called up onto the chat for people who need to or want to reach out to Mount Sinai later. And there was a reference, Dr. Morrison, to the research that's been done about the value of palliative care. And is that kind of research available on the website as well? Um, some of the key articles are available on the website. The other place which they are available is um, at the Center to Advance Palliative Care, which is also part of our department. And that can be found at capc.org. Thank you. I suspect one of my staff is about to type that in to the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're gonna to get to some of the endless questions we had in <laughs> advance. Um, so are there a lot of forms you have to fill out to get into these programs and um, either hospice or palliative care? And where do I get these forms if I need to do so, perhaps on behalf of my parent? Um, guys, you want me to talk about oh, sure, that sure. one? <laughs> sure, There's, there are always forms. There are the, always. Reality, <laughs> the reality is there are always forms. Um, um, most often, both in hospice and in palliative care, 
when you access the service, that's when the forms come along. It's not something that you do in advance. If we're doing something along the lines of telehealth, yes, we would email them to you. Or in some cases, we work with patients that are not on any type of, of uh, telehealth or, or um, advanced technology and just have a landline. And then we will snail mail them those forms to fill out in advance to help speed the process if that's something that's desired. So yes, there are always forms. Yeah. Okay. And there's always help to fill out the forms. Correct. <laughs> Thank you, Adrian. <laughs> that was a follow-up question I was going to ask you. You know, for those out here listening and learning today who have family and friends who can help them when they're feeling particularly bad, you know, it's one reality. But more and more, we find people calling my office that for a lot of different reasons, they don't have anyone around to help them at this point. So even if they're feeling like a little overwhelmed by life and that they can't take on something else, even though I think it's clear taking on the assistance of palliative care can be a huge victory for them, they can reach out and then you have people who can help them fill out the forms, help them walk through what they perhaps think of as too overwhelming to deal with themselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Um, who decides whether you're in need of hospice and whether or not you should be in a hospital setting or the home? I do know there's a rule about six months to live, but I don't think I would know if I was at month six and a half. Um, <laughs> so who's making these decisions and how do we deal with that? And Senator, you put your finger on exactly the challenge of the hospice system, is that six months, I don't know who's going to live or who's going to die. Um, and so how do, we, how do we figure it out? Um, the Medicare hospice guidelines say that two physicians have to attest that Death will is likely to occur within six months if the disease follows its usual course. Um, the challenge is that we often don't know that. Um, and we tend to get better at that right, at, right, right before death happens. So the way that we approach this is really threefold. The first is for people who could benefit from hospice and um, only want to focus on comfort and stay at home, and if I think there's a very high likelihood that if the disease falls its usual course, that there is a chance that death will occur within six months, absolutely, we will enroll that person in hospice. And if I'm wrong and somebody lives longer than six months, terrific. Um, they can continue on the hospice program um, and continue and continue. It's a guideline, but we're not perfect. Um, however, if that person also wants to pursue disease-directed treatments, or in my medical opinion, prognosis isn't in years, that's the person that we would wanna follow from our palliative care team. And at some point in the future, if their goals change and they wanna focus only on comfort and prognosis shortens, then we help with that bridge to hospice um, and help with the enrollment into hospice and transition them into a hospice program. The other thing that I think it's important for people to understand is that in the United States, hospice is a home-based service. Um, there are very few buildings where you can go to and receive care. And in fact, the legislation says that 80% of hospice care has to be delivered at home. So that people can come into an inpatient hospice setting for an acute crisis, right at the end of life or if the family needs respite, but there are very few opportunities for somebody to be in hospice, in a hospice setting, in an inpatient setting for a long period of time. And that's unfortunately the way that the system is in the United States. Uh, Brenda, Adrian, did I miss anything? Yeah, I mean, what I can speak I to my own personal experience. My grandmother was in hospice for my, nine months 
So, you know, we just worked with the hospice team of outlining expectations and, you know, how and if treatment was going to change in any way. Um, but it certainly wasn't a threat of getting kicked off at any time. Um, yeah, and then I agree. I think, I think what complicates the piece about being home is that, um, you know, this is New York. People have to work and, and have to be able to support and really on home hospice, someone has to be the primary caregiver, right? Whether it's family or friends or paid hired help. So that's always a challenge. Um, I think families are surprised by that information. Yeah, I think also adding that hospice care can be provided at home in a nursing home setting. That's, that's one of the, the little ways, but most people don't wanna be in a nursing home. And so that's where it becomes problematic again at the end of life and, and where do we provide that care? So there are some questions on, on how do we help people at end of life with those types of decisions. But the goal is to look at those types of questions early. And that's kind of the goal of what our palliative care programs do to look at those questions earlier so that we can address decisions before we get to that point. What will it look like when I get to that point in my life and my daughter has to work? Who's gonna take care of me? You know, So those are the things that we try to help with. And I would say that you know, we are partnering with our policymakers with our, both at the federal and the state level to address the needs of what is a new population um, right. and recognize that the system is not a perfect fit for the needs and that we need to make some transitions and adjust it. And I know Senator Kruger, you know that very well. I agree. Um, and, and follow up on that, doctor. So I'm, we're going to play this as if I'm the adult child of someone I believe needs palliative care, if not at that stage, perhaps understanding whether or not they need hospice care. So I can talk to their doctor and say, please refer my parent to palliative care. One, my, my parent may not actually recognize how important this would be because perhaps one of their illnesses is dementia. And then is their doctor supposed to be talking to me if their patient is saying, I'm perfectly fine. I don't know why she keeps saying all these things are happening to me. You know, I, that's, I don't know how uncommon that is. I actually suspect it's pretty common um, that the person who really needs these services is not the first one to admit them, particularly because they don't want to admit them to their children because then they walk into that fascinating issue many of us have to deal with of a bit of role reversal between who's caring for whom Mm -hmm. um, so I see head shaking, so I'm not really crazy here, but how do we start this process if perhaps the person who would value it so much, if they knew about it, doesn't want to even talk to their own doctor about this? I think Adrian, you come, you hit this all the time in the, the, inpatient setting, you know, yeah, having a lot of the time, my consultation is a surprise to the patient and their family and, and they don't, you know, didn't attend a lecture like this to really understand how palliative care is different from hospice. And so I just start from the beginning. And that's why we really try to capture you when you are in the hospital, because it's just a little bit of an indication for us that, you know, things may be going on that need to be addressed. Um, and yeah, I think just showing, right? What we do that we're not forcing either way or a direction or have an agenda. We're just really trying to help overall make the whole healthcare process just a little bit easier. I think I would just add to that, that one of the, our key roles is to provide an added layer of support. And we recognize yeah. that serious illness does not just affect patients, that it's a, it's a, it's a family. And I, you know, I was nodding because I hear this all the time where somebody says, I'm really worried about my mom, I'm really worried about my dad. Um, and, you know, what do I do about that? And my advice to many people is, 
as your mother's doctor, I can't really, I can't talk to you without her permission. You know, I, that's a trusted relationship. That being said, I can listen to everybody. And if you're worried, I want to hear it. I won't, I can't engage in a conversation, but Senator Kruger, if you wanted to call me and say, you know, I'm really worried about X, Y, or Z, um, I'll just listen. That's information. And then I can bring it up and say, you know, I think you might benefit from an added layer of support. You know, I think it would be helpful to see my colleagues. Um, and I wouldn't make anything more of it than when I say, you know, I don't like this little spot on your skin. I think it would be good to see your dermatologist. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, you know, you're having some trouble with your joints. I think it'd be really good to see your orthopedist. You know, you're having a little trouble. I see you got here late because you had challenges getting here. I think it might be helpful to see. And that's the way the process starts. And as Adrian said, you know, nine times out of 10, people don't know that we're coming or that why we're there. But, you know, once it's explained, um, you know, I can count on one hand the number of people who said, sorry, I don't need an added layer of support. Um, can your team be helpful with insurance questions? I know I set my earlier question in the context of Medicare, um, but are there added expenses with palliative care that people would need to either pay out of pocket or apply for different insurance? Is there, this is new to me, but is there a nursing home insurance that people can pay for as add-on if that in fact is the recommendation of palliative care because you know the person's not literally at the end of life, but they are not in a position to remain at home taking care of themselves. Does that also sort of flow through you or does that become someone else? I'm a we, little confused. I mean, honestly, we don't have the resources to be able to answer insurance questions from everybody in the public that is facing those. And believe me, everybody in the public faces healthcare <laughs> insurance issues. Yeah. What we do have the resources for is that if somebody is in our program, um, and Brenda can talk about this. Um, we have specific expertise because we know what's available in the community. We have a pretty good idea about what are the various options under various types of insurance plans. Um, and to a certain extent, we even know what's uncovered. But Brenda, do you want to elaborate a little bit? Sure. Um, I will first of all acknowledge the fact that insurance is the biggest beast in our healthcare system mm -hmm. and that it is complex and complicated. And even though I do this as part of my job every single day, every single day it changes. And so everyone should realize that they're not alone in feeling confused by their insurances. Um, Mount Sinai and all the other hospitals all have financial offices who can assist with different types of financial questions and insurance questions. You know, you may have to make a phone call, you may have to follow up with them, but they can assist you with those things. Um, as far as something like going into a nursing home and how do you pay for that? Well, you know, if you have a long-term care policy, which is private insurance, that might pay for it, might not. You have to look at it on a case by case basis. Um, Medicare pays for short-term stays in a, in a nursing home, but only very short-term stays for rehab. You would have to apply for Medicaid, and that becomes a whole nother aspect of insurance and how do we apply and how do we qualify. And it's, it's really bigger than we can talk about here at this moment. But yes, if we can't address the problem directly ourselves, we certainly have the resources and the understanding of pointing people into the right direction. Great. Um, we didn't talk a lot about the different drug therapies and we don't have a lot of time to jump into it, but can I, I'll just briefly, and I guess I'll refer to Dr. Morrison. So when my own parents were in hospice, what I learned was my assumption that you know, there's just, there's just morphine and that's towards the very, very end. But in fact, there were a variety of drugs that really were helping to get some sleep because the, fam the family member was 
actually more functional when they had gotten a good night's sleep. My mother had COPD and we learned that actually morphine can help you breathe better um, as opposed to necessarily be a pain management issue because my mother didn't feel pain basically for whatever reason her whole life she never felt pain but it actually was helping her breathe that there were some other drugs that were improving response on dementia with my dad so again these are all your 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 specialties right yes it is and i think one of the challenges of medical education in this country is that we learn a lot how to treat organs and diseases and very little about how to treat symptoms and you know, I spent four years at the University of Chicago, three years at Cornell, two years here, and had a 30 minute lecture on how to manage pain that happened in my pharmacology course. Uh, learned nothing about how to treat breathlessness, learned nothing how to treat fatigue, learned nothing how to treat nausea, um, because it wasn't taught. And one of the things that we are doing in palliative care, or two of the things is, one is that that is expertise that we all have, that we know how to treat symptoms, both the medications that work and the non-pharmacological interventions that work. And the second thing is we're really advocating that those skills, knowledge and skills become key parts of physician training, nurse training, and um, Adrian will tell you, nursing is about five years ahead of us on this in terms of in medicine, in terms of symptom management. Um, and even social work training where there's a key component on the psychological and emotional aspects of living with a serious illness, even there, there are gaps. So we, palliative care teams have that expertise, which you pointed out is very important, and we're working to ensure that others have it, but we're still a ways to go. Well, thank you. And we really have run out of time um, and you all have very busy days. And so I appreciate so much all three of you being willing to take um, a part of your morning to help educate us. And again, for those of you, you had more questions being typed in. We just didn't get to everything, but I encourage everybody to start reading about palliative care and hospice and learning about um, this really underutilized model of healthcare that I think is so important. Um, I know that another palliative care doctor once told me that when he would go around the world and do presentations and talk at conferences, doctors from every other country would say, what is it with you Americans? You think you're not going to die? You don't wanna <laughs> learn anything about end of life issues? You just put your heads in the sand. And he said that he really sort of realized that we as a culture don't think about this enough and that we train our healthcare professionals that if you can't save their lives, you have no assignment here. And I thought that that was so telling um, for us as a country and as a culture to start to grip the fact that yes, of course, at the end, we do all pass. And that with the right kinds of healthcare and interventions, we can make radical improvements um, in how people do lead their lives, both towards the end, or we didn't get into a lot of this today, when you're going through a debilitating illness, but they very well may cure you. But during the time you're going through the debilitating illness, mm -hmm. you need all these same kinds of health assistance and um, tools. So again, Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you all who have been listening in today. Our next scheduled roundtable will be Thursday, February 18th from 10 to 11.30. And there we will be talking about living wills and healthcare proxies, which came up just briefly today. And please remember, stay safe, protect yourselves and others. If you have to go out, wear a mask, social distance, Remember to wash your hands. You've been doing this so well for so many months. I wish I could tell you the vaccine was gonna be available next week, but I'm not that confident in the timelines. So we just all have to continue to stay safe and healthy until we can get herd immunity. Again, Senator Liz Kruger, thank you, my wonderful staff for putting this all together. See you in a week or so, bye. Thank you.
Thank you.